Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Murray. I'm director here at the Department of Archives and History. And it is a pleasure to welcome you to our facility this evening for this very special opening event for History Lives On, Preserving Alabama's Rosenwald Schools. Uh, we, all of us here at the archives are extraordinarily grateful for the opportunity to partner with Auburn University's College of Architecture, Design, and Construction in hosting this exhibition, which is the uh, one manifestation of a, of a large project to document the extraordinary story of the creation, operation, and sustenance and preservation of Alabama's Rosenwald schools, and the stories of the extraordinary Alabamians who uh, received educations there and have since uh, adapted some of those facilities for other uses, and importantly today are leading the effort to preserve these structures and the history that they offer to us about the history of education, the history of African American communities in Alabama, and serve as important beacons to us with important lessons for us to absorb today about the value of education, the importance of commitment of community to support education locally, and the extraordinary accomplishments of those who made the construction of the Rosenwald schools possible. I want to thank uh, the, the sponsors for our fantastic reception. I know you enjoyed upstairs, CC and Litchfield Architects here in Montgomery, and also the sponsor of our panel discussion this evening, the Alabama Humanities Alliance. We're grateful for the support that they provided to make this evening possible. So the exhibit is open now and will run through May of 2024. We hope that you'll come back, bring your friends and neighbors and family to share with them the extraordinary stories that you saw upstairs on the second floor this evening. We also encourage you to join us just a couple of days from now, uh, Thursday, October 19th, for the next installment of our monthly Food for Thought lecture series as Sophia Bracey Harris presents her memoir, Finding My Own Way, a journey to wholeness against the odds, which documents her experiences uh, growing up in rural Alabama during the Jim Crow era, overcoming numerous obstacles to achieve great success and her lifetime of work in education and public service. We also wanna recognize some special guests who are here tonight. Those include alumni and those associated with schools that were a part of the uh, rural Construction Programs by Tuskegee Institute and the Rosenwald Fund. And we know we've got alumni and friends of three schools. And I know I had personal conversations with folks from even Tennessee and Georgia uh, who are here this evening with associations with Rosenwald schools in those states. Uh, but here locally, uh, those of you who have associations with the Harris Barrett School, which is one of the precursor schools developed by Tuskegee, are you in the audience? right here in front. We're so glad to have you here. The uh, Mount Sinai School, where's our Mount Sinai folks? Okay, quite a few of you, wonderful. The Tankersley Rosenwald School, where are our Tankersley folks? Right up here on the, on the thank, there you are. And we know there are others. Who else is here who has association with another Rosenwald School? All right, quite a few. Well, we honor the legacy of, of those institutions and your families and sustaining those institutions over many years and the great work that's happening across the South today to preserve those, those buildings. We also want to recognize uh, the Auburn and Tuskegee University Architecture Schools. We have some representatives of the student body and the faculty who are here tonight. If you're associated with either of those institutions, just raise your hand and let us know where you are. <laughs> Several students here, thank you for being here. Uh, and now to introduce our speakers. Uh, first of all, Mr. Thomas Boyd. Mr. Boyd is president of the Montgomery County Farmer Service and Welfare, Welfare Association, which owns the Tankersley Rosenwald School in Hope Hull. And Mr. Boyd has been a leader in the rehabilitation of the school. Uh, they received a 2021 African American Civil Rights Preservation Grant from the National Park Service. And he continues to be among the leadership, the leaders who are, who are preserving that uh, institution. 
Gorham Bird is Assistant Professor of Architecture at Auburn University and a registered ar architect. His research and outreach have included partnering with the local communities to document and preserve Alabama's remaining Rosenwald schools. Dorothy Walker is Site Director at the Freedom Rides Museum, a historic site of our friends at the Alabama Historical Commission. And Dorothy has 25 years of experience working in historic preservation and cultural resource advocacy uh, and project management. And Alabama's Rosenwald Schools are just one of numerous projects that she has pursued and supported for many years. And uh, I appreciate Dorothy being here and lending her expertise to this conversation this evening. And then last but not least, moderating this panel this evening is, uh, is the archive's own Sam Christensen. Sam is our exhibits curator and he was our project lead working with Gorham on the installation of the exhibit upstairs. Uh, Sam does great work and uh, is representative of the really terrific team of professionals we have here who are committed to collecting, preserving, and sharing the Alabama stories that belong to all of you. that introduction, Steve, and good, e good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I hope everybody had plenty of time to spend in the exhibit upstairs. So our discussion tonight's really gonna cover the present state of the extant Rosenwald schools in Alabama, the future, and uh, how and why these buildings have survived and how they're being preserved. So let's start off with a little bit of context with, with Dorothy here. So what is the history of the Rosenwald Fund and what role did Alabama play in its creation? Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Because if you can't, I'm a good country girl. I can speak louder. <laughs> um, so the Rosenwald School Program story is a story that begins in Alabama. And I think sometimes with it being a national story, I think its role and its genesis here in the state kind of gets lost. But the first name we always have to call when we start talking about Rosenwald Schools is Booker T. Washington, right? Um, that Wizard of Tuskegee. And so um, in 1911, uh, uh, as Booker T. Washington did so often, he was on a speaking engagement um, going north, right, uh, to find funds for Tuskegee and the work that he was doing there. And he met Julius Rosenwald. And Rosenwald was so impressed with him, um, he had recently read Up From Slavery. Um, Washington's autobiography. And he was very impressed with the story of Washington and what he was trying to uh, accomplish and achieve at Tuskegee. Um, and so, of course, as Washington did, and he was so good at, um, he um, invited Wa uh, Rosenwald down to Tuskegee um, to see what he was doing down there at, at the university and, and all he was trying to accomplish. So Rosenwald did, he took a party of folks down to Tuskegee and um, was very impressed with what um, Washington had done, um, what the community had done, what Tuskegee stood for, and what Tuskegee was building. And he obviously wanted to invest in that. So um, he sent Washington, um, Booker to Washington, um, fund, funds to support what was happening at Tuskegee. And of course, Booker T. Washington being the shrewd person that he was, um, he, had, he did what he um, had asked um, or had planned to do with some of that funding, but he had funds left over. So he wrote to, uh, to Julius Rosenwald and said, you know, I, we have this program, this school building program. Now, as Sam mentioned earlier, or um, Steve mentioned earlier, um, Booker T. Washington uh, was building school buildings before he met Julius Rosenwald. So I wanna make sure we all remember that. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, um, uh, Booker T. Washington, one of the things that he did um, soon after coming, and, I'm, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, you all know this story, but do, uh, Dr. Washington had gone on a, a tour of the South and he understood that not everyone was going to be able to come to Tuskegee and that there was a lack of facilities uh, for students, uh, for, for black students in the South. And so um, he had teamed up with um, a, an oil baron, H.H. Um, Rogers, um, to um, 
fund the construction of some schools uh, as a prototype before he met, before he and Ro uh, Rosenwald teamed up, and he had built 46 schools. Um, but Rogers died before they could really get that program off the ground. And so this was a program that was in progress and it was languishing and Washington needed funds. And so he used, and so um, Rosenwald gave him permission to use the remaining um, funds to, to build these schools. And so with those funds, um, Washington built um, or invested in with communities, of course, the community support invested in building six Rosenwald school buildings. Um, and these schools, um, the first six, um, were in this region, three of which were in Montgomery County, actually. And um, he wrote to uh, Rosenwald about the success of this, of these school buildings, and of course, um, for those of you who, anybody here that doesn't know the history of Julius Rosenwald, Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I like to tell people he was the, uh, he was the uh, CEO of the Amazon of his day, right? Sears, you could buy everything from a casket to a house through Sears. And Rosenwald um, um, knew that, you know, this would also be good business, right, to get into the school building because they could furnish the supplies. But um, what they were, he was very impressed and, um, of course, sent Washington more money um, to, to get involved in investing in these schools. So they teamed up, and again, I wanna make sure that Alabama's role here is emphasized. The first 100 of these 5,000 plus school buildings were built in Alabama. And um, it, was a, it was a massive program and a massive success. Um, and of course, uh, Booker T. Washington passes away in 1915, and um, the Rosenwald Fund it yeah, becomes a, um, it, there, there's a transition from Tuskegee, um, and of course the um, architect at Tuskegee at that time, Robert R. Taylor, if you don't know that name, it is a name you definitely should know, um, a, the, one of the first degreed black um, architect in, this, in the country. And um, he was, had designed these schools. Well, the fund moved from Tuskegee to Tennessee and under Samuel Smith, who was one of the premier building, school builders at that time, and it really took on a much bigger uh, role at that point. Of course, it had spread to other states. By the time it ended in 1932, you had more than 5,000 school buildings in 15 southern states. Um, Alabama had 389 of these buildings, not all of them schools. Um, some were teacher homes, shop buildings. Um, and of course, um, the, the, the state that had the most was North Carolina at over 800. So that's sort of the quick and dirty history of it. It's a great answer. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you mentioned the community elements of building the schools and that's really led to a lot of the preservation work that's allowed some of these buildings to remain, right? I mean, it's. The, uh, they've been very attractive candidates for conventional preservation in terms of rebuilding and reuse. Uh, meanwhile, Auburn's College of Architecture, Design and Construction is working to preserve the schools in a slightly different way. So Gorham, what can you tell us about the, uh, the Realizing Rosenwald project and how do you think that it fits into the broader efforts to preserve these buildings? Yeah, the, <clears throat> um, let me adjust this. Perfect. Um, I, I just have to, um, I called Dorothy earlier the, the queen of the Rosenwald schools, and I think she just proved that. That was amazing. Uh, she said to me, you have notes, and I didn't prepare anything. I said, well, clearly she doesn't need notes. So um, <laughs> that was uh, amazing. But I, I think um, what, the, what the research we've been doing here at Auburn for the last, uh, I guess, three years now has been taking some of the kind of latest technology um, that, uh, that's been in the industry for a little while, but starting to find ways to use it uh, and, and as a way of kind of outreach into the community. And so realizing Rosenwald became the name of this kind of research project. But for me, it was much more about like my own realization of the Rosenwald schools. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have to, you know, um, uh, I'm a white kid uh, and, and grew up not knowing anything about the history of the Rosenwald schools. And I'm living in Auburn, Alabama, and I realized the very first uh, school, I mean, this is up for debate, but uh, is in Lochapoca, 
And I'm thinking, wow, this is a local, you know, uh, Auburn, Alabama, uh, Lee County, uh, Macon, Montgomery County history, you know. Uh, and as I start digging deeper into it, I realize, you know, this program uh, made generational impacts, and you all know this, but uh, incredible impacts in such a challenging time. Um, and so for me, it became a kind of personal pursuit of like learning more about this. But the technology, what it's been able to allow us to do is um, visit these remaining schools. So uh, Dorothy mentioned 389 schools once existed. Uh, the best estimates are 10 to 12% remain, but I, I would argue even there's even less than that that remain in Alabama. We know of about 14 to 15. And so what our project has been doing is trying to, first of all, find out where these schools are. Um, so the kind of identification of the schools, but then um, what we do is go in and document the schools. So photograph them, use some uh, LIDAR technology and, and uh, scanners to digitally document them. Um, what the really great thing about that is it documents these uh, schools with incredible precision. Uh, so if I want to know how, how bad the uh, Tankersley floor is sagging, I can go in there and measure uh, it sags four inches, right? It's incredible precision. But being able to use that technology uh, to then help uh, a group like the Tankersley School figure out then how to uh, preserve the school, because that's the next step. Um, a lot of the schools we've come into contact with, uh, New Hope is an example, Shiloh's an example, um, Harris Barrett's an example, schools that have been uh, maintained for, for generations. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a handful that, that need, need intervention and need some, um, some work. And so me as an architect can, and my team at Auburn um, has been able to kind of provide some service to help um, figure out how to preserve the schools. Um, and so, uh, you know, partnering with the Tankersley uh, organization to apply for a grant from the National Park Service to allow them to get funding um, to preserve a school, it's been it's been kind of where we are currently, um, and it's you know who knows where it will end. I think we'll just keep going as long as we can. Outstanding. Yeah. yeah. What first got you into uh, historic preservation? So uh, personally, um, it started as a young kid. Um, again, looking at, uh, I was fascinated with old buildings. I think I think probably a lot of us share that fascination. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's something about a building that existed before your own lifetime that uh, piques some interest in all of us. Um, and so I knew I wanted to be an architect. I just have always been interested in, in that. But um, what I have realized as an adult is that um, buildings hold stories. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, stories get passed down from generation through oral history, from doing what we're doing now, from telling your kids and grandkids about your life experience. But buildings have a capacity to kind of hold a history mm -hmm. um, beyond what, what we can kind of say. There's something special about walking into a place that you know some event occurred uh, and being able to witness it yourself. It, it brings history to life. Um, and I think, I think we all need that as kind of humans to be able to kind of understand our, our place in time today. So, um, yeah, that, that keeps me going. Um, every time I see a new Rosenwald school, I have to tell a story. Uh, we're, we're one Christmas going to look for a Christmas tree uh, out in uh, rural Chambers County. And I've been doing this research a little bit. And um, we're heading to a tree farm. And all of a sudden, I see County Road such and such. And I was like, oh, we have to turn. Uh, granted, granted, I have the whole family in the car, and we're supposed to go get a tree, and, and they're like, well, it's a dirt road, and, and they're like, what? where are we going? I was like, I'm pretty sure there's a Rosenwald school down here. We're going. <laughs> and the next hour and a half, we're still on that same dirt road. Uh, that's my wife. Um, I think everyone thinks we're lost. Uh, but sure enough, we ended up finding the New Hope School, uh, and I got in touch with George Barrow soon after that. So. Again, it's just this fascination, almost like a treasure hunt, uh, to find these schools and, and then meet the folks, hear the stories, uh, and, and help them to preserve them. Yeah, and I guess one of the stories documented in Rosen, or Realizing Rosenwald, as well as History Lives On, is the story of the Tankersley School. So 
Thomas, could you tell us the story of how the Tankersley School was founded? How the Tankersley School was founded. It was the year 1917. A man named Jacob W. Williams. He established a school after he arrived in Hope Hall, Alabama. He established a school, but he had no place, no place to, uh, for the building. He conferred with the uh, community leaders, and uh, they let him use the Masonic Hall. After the Masonic Hall got crowded, they uh, decided they needed another building. And The school was be for black children. And uh, they, they went to the school board. The school board required them to have 15 acres in order to build a school. The community got together and raised the, uh, the funds to buy the first five acres. And uh, After that, they uh, I'm a little nervous. Bear with me. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. All good. <laughs> the community got together and uh, uh, they purchased the five acres from uh, Dr. William Tankersley, who then was a uh, member of the Montgomery County Board of Education. And uh, if I can jump in and say, help Mr. Boyd out a little bit, okay. um, I will say that um, one of the things I neglected to say earlier in the Tankersley Project and Mr. Boyd's role has been so instrumental in saving that school. Um, you mean, I mean, when you talk about passion and sacrifice and commitment, um, it's, he, his, it's, it's overwhelming, his passion for that building. Um, but one of the things I neglected to say, and one of the things I found interesting about Tankersley, is that when these school, when they design these school buildings, a lot of times when people think about school buildings that were that old, older school buildings, wood frame buildings, a lot of times we like to say one room schoolhouse, right? Um, and one of the interesting things about Rosenwald uh, plans was that they were not based on the number of rooms. They were based on the number of teachers. So if, you, if you're looking, if you look at the files, and I found that very fascinating when I first started looking at Rosenwald School, because I was so used to hearing all my life too, one room school building or one room schoolhouse, but they were based on the number of teachers. And so you had, so because you might have a building, a Rosenwald school that was one room, but you had, you might have three teachers or four teachers or six teachers because they had partition walls. The interesting thing about the Rosenwald plan is that it was always meant to be a flexible space to, to, to have more in less, right? To take, to use what you have, but to expand it. So you might have first through third grade in one room and then fourth through six in another room, right, Mr. Boyd? Right. And so, but you also would have, um, you would also have a stage. Right. And, Summer. yes, like Tankersley had. Right. Um, but also, um, they had things like uh, cloak rooms um, and the windows. If you visit Tankersley or any of these Rosenwald schools, the windows are what really draw you in, right? Because of the natural lighting. 
And one of the things that um, um, uh, Robert Taylor did when he was building, when he was designing these school buildings, is also consult with who else at Tuskegee? George Washington Carver about um, the uh, how how hygienic how to keep this because these a lot of these weren't going to have electricity in the beginning um, so how do you keep the hygiene how do you keep how do you maximize lighting all of that it was it was cutting edge technology for its day um, and so I think that's also part of what that are, that attracts a lot of folks to Rosemont schools is that they were so well built and and so well um, and the communities, one of the things that really struck me about the Rosenwald School history when I first learned about it was that, and, and Rosenwald and Washington came to this conclusion together, that it was not, it was always going to be a matching grant program, right? Like Mr. Boyd said, the community had to give up the, had to provide the land. The, com the community had to build, a, have to provide the labor to build the building. The community had to provide the maintenance on the building. All of that was the community. So it, it might have said on paper that the community gave one third, but in reality, the community gave way more than that. The, the, the buildings became an integral part of the community because of what they sacrificed. Um, so when you see the statistics in the Rosenwald files that the school board gave this amount or the white community gave this amount and the Rosenwald fund gave this amount, the amount that the Rosenwald fund gave, and this was by design, was very small con con um, in comparison to what the community <laughs> gave. Uh, because even after the buildings are built, the community still had to maintain them. Um, there are stories that, like Gorham said, that draw you in. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Mr. Boyd has some, um, of people um, having to take the coal to the school so that the, the students had a way to keep warm in the winter. or to come out and fix, repair the schools when there was damage. All of these things that, how do you put a price to that, right? It's priceless. And I think that's the part that, that really gets to us when we're talking about schools and communities like the one, like Tankersley. Mm -hmm. That's after the first uh, five acres were purchased, the citizens got together and uh, uh, purchased the next 10 acres to make the 15. So uh, the community provided $1,500. The uh, public provided $2,800. And the Rosenwald Fund provided $1,000. But those stories, <laughs> the stories of the people and the resilience, right, of communities um, and Gorham talking about driving down country roads, part of what, part of the challenge has been um, for the State Historic Preservation Office as we've worked with communities all across the state to try to document these school buildings is when they were built, there was no E911 system, right? There was no County Road 12. They were, <laughs> they were built out next to the Shiloh school, uh, Church or they were built, you know, next to um, the, the, the community center or whatever, they were, they were built out in the middle of fields. So trying to locate these school buildings um, has been a challenge, but it's also, it's been, been rewarding to work with communities who care enough, who have cared enough over the generations to try to preserve those stories even when the building's no longer there. Um, and that's, as long as we continue to tell the story of these school buildings, they will always be with us. We, we will never lose them because they, they will live on, on in these stories that we pass on, but we must pass those stories on. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, thinking about some of the statistics you were talking about earlier, where there's 5,000 schools built in 20-ish years across 15 states, what, what do you think made the program as successful as it was? I think it was the communities who really were committed to providing quality education for their, for their young people. Um, I, I, when we think about the success of Rosenwald uh, schools, and I wanna say also, I wanna interject that a lot of people say, well, why are they called Rosenwald schools? Because Rosenwald objected to these school buildings having his name on, on them. Um, 
which says a lot about him as a philanthropist, right? That he was giving as much as he was, but he did not want shrines to him. And I know that there are some folks here from Tennessee who actually have Rosenwald in the name of their building. But a lot, most of these were called the Shiloh School or the Mount Zion School or the, or the Hope, Hope, the Hope uh, Community School. They, they were not named for Rosenwald. And I think the, the balance that Booker T. Washington and, and Julius Rosenwald tried to, tried to garner with these buildings, that they would be community buildings, that they would not be all these shrines to Booker T. Washington or Rosenwald, that the community would be owners, they would be, they would take ownership of these buildings and would have buy-in. I think that's what made the program so successful, is because the communities, they built the buildings, they maintained the buildings, and they, they looked after these schools. The stories you hear of people, um, the sacrificing everything, putting up their land to, to help, uh, to, to help purchase property for the school or help purchase materials for the school. I mean, that, the sacrifices, I think, is what led to the success of the schools. Now, the same thing, I think, that led to the success of these school buildings eventually also lead to um, the challenges that the school faced because many communities outgrow these buildings. Um, and the next generation of school buildings start to be constructed in these, uh, of course, more substantial buildings, brick buildings, that replace these schools, and you have that um, diversion of resources to these other school buildings, by the way, called equalization schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you have that, you have these, re these schools starting to take over, but I think the success was the community, that the, the sacrifice and the commitment that they made to these schools. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we talked about earlier, you know, only 10 to 12% of these schools remain, possibly less in Alabama. Mm -hmm. I guess really for all of you, what do you think goes into a successful Rosenwald preservation project? I mean, wh why do you think those 10% of schools have remained when others haven't? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is like, I think you have to stop and think for a second. Um, a lot of the schools are at least 100 years old, right? And think about a building you know that's built out of wood. <laughs> that's 100 years old, there's not many. So I think to kind of Dorothy's point earlier, that speaks to the how well they were built, right? Not only how well they were built, how well they were designed. They were designed to last. Um, and so I think what we have found in terms of um, the, the types of issues that pop up in an old building that are the ones that will destroy it is the roof. Honestly, if you can keep the water out of yeah. the building, it's gonna last a whole lot longer. And so. Um, we're, we're working with Tankersley now, and, and there was a slow leak in the roof, and after a few years, that leak got bigger and uh, then developed a hole in the roof, and then that hole in the roof then led to a hole in the floor, right? And it just, if you can keep, keep the building dry, it's gonna last a lot longer. And uh, the National um, Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, as well as the National Park Service, has a bunch of, for, this is for kind of organizations out there, uh, tips and recommendations on what's called mothballing a building, which is uh, getting it as dry as you can, covering protecting windows. Like if you're in a state where you can't invest a bunch of money, you can mothball the building uh, and, and help to sustain it for a longer period of time. Thomas. And Thomas, you look like you're about to say something. I want to get back to the uh, tank of the Rosenwald yeah. School. In 1922, it was completed and served the community until uh, 1967, when the integration uh, said the Board of Education closed it. Long lived. What are your organization's plans for the school? The organization's plans for the school is to uh, make a community center out of it and uh, maybe have a tutoring for students, young students. and. Uh, if, if possible. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. That sounds great. And um, I guess we were also talking about some of the technology and realizing Rosenwald earlier, and you sort of touched on this earlier, but Gorm, could you say a little bit more about what potential you see for this, uh, this technology contributing to preservation? I think the, um, the potential for the technology is that it gets people excited about preservation. I think that's probably the, the most exciting part for me. 
Uh, I like to think t the technology makes preservation cool again. Uh, I've always thought preservation is really cool, but um, uh, but I think what um, going back to kind of Dorothy's comment about passing on the stories for generations, uh, I think uh, a lot of folks need to think about how your your story gets passed on, right? Um, and how do you how do we start to uh, include younger generations in in this story? Uh, and I think technology, in my mind, technology is the way to do it. Um, you know, not, not only because younger generations are you know, more facile with technology, but um, so I would, I would encourage all of you to talk to your children, talk to your grandchildren about, uh, about your experience um, and, and let that kind of knowledge get transferred across generations because, the, you know, the technology is going to, you know, uh, fade and, and change and do something else in 10 years, right? But um, uh, but those stories have to just kind of continue to be um, in, in our minds or, or, or they're lost. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the kind of exciting thing is to see how can we get young people involved and, um, you know, um, what the, the one challenge is uh, with the technology is it's, it can be expensive, some of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, some of us have uh, an iPhone, uh, and so the same technology that um, is in some of the higher end um, technology we use is in an iPhone, um, and so you can actually begin to do some scanning with a phone. Um, maybe some of us need to ask our grandkids about that, but um, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's wild, but uh, to me, that's, that's the key is that intergenerational inter uh, kind of work um, to, to continue these stories. Because the, the next generation is gonna have to preserve these buildings. And, um, and uh, it's something we all need to be thinking about. Yeah. And in terms of passing that torch, kind of mm -hmm. rounding out to our final question, and this is addressed to all of you ultimately, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll start with Dorothy. So what do you think to you is the significance of historic preservation and, and why should people be concerned about it? Historic preservation is one of those things that will live on beyond us. I mean, as much as we think that we're going to live forever, that is not the case. One day this room will be full of people and it won't be us. And when we preserve places like Tankersley and um, the work that um, Gorham and his students are doing, those places can live on, that that history can live, live on past us but it requires us to be proactive, right? In both, sometimes in, uh, even when the place is no longer there, the stories can still be told. Historical markers can be erected. Um, I, you know, we, I think part of what the challenge is, and I've been working in preservation for a couple of decades now, and part of what I think the, the challenge about preservation is we want people to come to preservation as preservationists. I think we need to meet people where they are. Um, I personally found out about Rosenwald Schools when I came to work for the State Historic Preservation Office um, some years back. I won't say how many, but um, <laughs> but for all, I went to school. The reason I had an education, the reason my mother and all of her siblings had an education, is because of Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald. My school started as a Rosenwald school. And to me, the unfortunate thing was that had I not taken the job that I have, that I have, I might not have ever known that story. And we allow our children and our grandchildren to go to the same schools. Now they are not necessarily the same buildings, but they started out in a lot of cases as Rosenwald schools, and then they became equalization schools. Um, we allow them to go through these school buildings and we don't tell them the stories, particularly when they've got the name of someone on the building, right? Who is this person? Why do we do that? Why do we allow our, gener our the, the, the next generations to go through school buildings not even knowing who that building is named for? And it's one thing to put up a plaque or an exhibit, but it's the stories. Mm -hmm is Mr. Boyd and all of these other folks who are trying so hard to preserve these buildings. It's, it's like Gorham said, 
It's just sitting down with these phones or whatever, a, a camera, and just recording those stories because that is what is going to have a lasting impact. Of course, we want to make sure the building and the places are saved and preserved, but if they're not, the stories need to be. And it's on us when we get to talking about, and I'm, I am so guilty of it, the young people don't know, right? That's what we say. <laughs> they don't care. That's on us because we haven't taught them to care. And the technology is so exciting. It's an exciting way to engage them. But just sitting down and saying to them, because a lot of these school buildings, like Mr. Boyd said, got closed because of integration. How many of our young people know that story? So I think preservation can be a conduit for, st for these stories, but also it is on the people, on us as individuals who know this history, who care about these places to also be the conduit and to pass those stories along. That's what preservation is. It doesn't mean you are a preservationist. It means you care about history and that history is told from the, from the vantage point of an authentic place. It's all about facilitating those connections. Yes. Yeah. I can't follow that. Sure you can. <laughs> it's non-competitive. Yeah. yeah. No, I, um, the, um, you know, I, I can't help but think about the, the time we're in today where facts don't seem to always mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I still don't understand that. Um, but there's something about hearing someone's story you, you can't take that away from them. You know, there's right. something about visiting a place where an event happened, where generations of kids learned to read and write, that you can't you can't argue with, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can argue about why and how and when and you know all the all the mess that gets involved, but you can't deny when something's been preserved, when a story's been told and, and passed on, you can't deny that. And I think that, to me, is um, why it's so critical that we we preserve and um, and make make bold statements about this happened here, right? And uh, because in a hundred years, who knows that that those facts might be up for debate, and if there's a record of them, it uh, it it makes that uh, kind of argument much more difficult. But um, I think. Uh, yeah, for me, preservation just allows, it, it, it's hard because you're always trying to um, kind of think forward, right, um, about the, those stories and how they get uh, passed on and told. But, um, you know, it, it takes, preservation takes what you read in a history book and makes it real. And, um, I, you know, I think that's why we got we to gotta keep doing it. Um, and it gives us a fuller and richer story of the struggles that people have gone through in the past, right? And, and makes them real. And I think that's the most important thing. Right. Pre pre preservation is uh, critical in our day and time. It's something to tell our kids. They wouldn't even understand what we had to go through with it. Mm -hmm. And to preserve it is of vital importance. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. At, at this time, we'd like to uh, invite any questions you'll have from the audience. We do ask that, uh, do wait for a, a staff member to bring you a microphone because we are recording this on YouTube and uh, th it'll help the people listening to it. Thank you so much for doing this program. Um, I am in the midst of attempting to trace my grandmother's um, steps. Um, she attended Tuskegee, um, finished in 1937, married my grandfather, who was uh, an administrator at Tuskegee, and then she taught at Children's House. And then she left and went to Chicago and taught up there and left granddaddy down here. Um, but I've been, I found out about the Rosenwald schools when I was looking at the Texas Freedom Colonies because my intern, um, found the Texas Freedom Colonies, and then I was falling asleep, because I'm not a, his, a history person, 
I was falling asleep watching the Texas historical um, videos and then see Booker T. Washington's picture go across the screen. And there are Rosenwald schools in the two freedom colonies that my great-great-grandparents are from and then my grandmother, great-grandmother was born. So I, my hypothesis is that Booker T. Washington's influence over my great-great-grandparents and my great-grandmother probably prompted them to send my grandmother um, to Tuskegee. And I'm trying to figure out, because I read that there, there were some grants through the Rosenwald Fund, and I wonder if she started going to Chicago to further her, maybe Booker T. Washington, no, Booker T. Washington was deceased by that time, but um, the uh, legacy of Booker T. Washington. Um, if she went to Chicago before she moved, she said, I, I knew her, and she said, oh, I would go to Chicago, um, you know, like temporarily to do some things. So I'm meeting with uh, the archivist at Tuskegee next week, but I am so um, interested in the Rosenwald schools because there were other things that Booker T. Washington funded in the freedom colonies or funds that he brought uh, for the farmers or farmer education, all these other things. And um, heading to Texas in December um, to go to the two places where my great grandparents lived and they were founders of one of the churches. And I was always told that the family gave land for education and I'm, you know, I'm 55 now and it didn't really interest me until two months ago. Um, so it's like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, and then my, my mom's family attended uh, Parker High School in Birmingham, which is the industrial high school, which also had a Booker T. Washington. My, my, my parent, my mother and my grandparents uh, both attended those schools. And so I really appreciate um, what you're doing. And, and one of my, my one question, and I'll follow up later and not take up any more time, but is how do people find out about the listing of the Rosenwald schools um, across the country. And I have been in touch with the Freedom Colony person at UVA, University of Virginia, um, Andrea, uh, I can't remember her last name, but she was at Texas A&M, Texas A and now she's at University of Virginia. And so I've been in touch with her about the Freedom Colonies, but not about the Rosenwald schools in particular. So I'm looking for some guidance um, to learn more about the Rosenwald schools. Well, I'll start off by talking about if you, if you're, I'm gonna answer a question, but I wanna, doc, wanna give the opportunity to say, if you're looking to document the history, if you want to pull the history of Rosenwald schools into your school's history, um, this is the book that I recommend that everybody get. Um, it's called The Rosenwald Schools of the American South by Mary, uh, Dr. Mary Hoshwelly. Um, and it will give you the, the context and the history for Rosenwald schools. Um, so if you haven't, and if, you're, if you attended a school or you care about a school, this is the book to start with because it will give you the history of how all of this got started. Um, there are, you're, you're doing certainly the right thing of starting with Tuskegee because there are a lot of files at Tuskegee. Uh, but there, the Rosenwald Fund, as I mentioned earlier, moved to Tennessee um, and went to Fisk University. And so there's tons of files at Fisk. Now for a while, those files were online on a database. Um, that database um, hasn't been active for a few years or for a while, and that may have been a, be a COVID thing. But um, that is, Fisk University has a wealth of information on the Rosenwald School files. Not all of it is going to have genealogical uh, information. So then you, we're sitting in a place for those people in Alabama where you would want to come and do the research here at the State Archives um, is a great place to kind of talk, when you're talking about land, um, ownership records, uh, census records, um, death, to, to all of that kind of stuff. And one of the interesting things about, that I've learned over the years of looking at Rosenwald schools is that you find information about Rosenwald schools in the most interesting places. And again, we say Rosenwald schools, but if it's the New Hope School or it's the Tanglesley School, that's what you need to search on. Because if you start your search off with Rosenwald schools, in terms of trying to document your school, you may not you may run into a roadblock. So I would certainly start with the name of the school. And if you don't have the name of the school, start with the community. If you don't have the name of the community, start with the county. I mean, it, there's ways to back it up. But when you start with Rosenwald, sometimes that won't lead you where you need to go. So I would say Tuskegee, Fisk, 
um, state, the state archives wherever you, are, if you live here in Alabama, state archives here, but also university archives. You'd be surprised at what's in these university archives, Alabama State University, um, all of the HBCU universities, and Auburn University, um, and uh, the archives there, your local library. Um, there is so much information on these school buildings. Um, one of the things I invest in personally is a subscription to newspapers.com because they, you can get um, archives of old newspapers. And it's, it's not a cheap subscription, but it's worth it to be able to go back in because even though it might have been a tiny little thing in a newspaper that mentioned the Negro school was built, it, at least you can trace it back to something. Um, so there are all there are multiple ways to to do this research, but I think you know. But the last thing I want to say is, I cannot overestimate or o overemphasize how important it is for us to trace our own families' histories to these buildings, because if we know our family genealogy, my mother and all of her siblings attended my school, and so um, I didn't have a picture of the Rosenwald building for for years. I had done this work for like 20 years before I ever saw a picture of the Rosenwald building that was on, that my school started as. And that's because a principal, right before he passed away, said, I have a yearbook from 1952. Would you like to have it? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And, but he didn't know that in there was a picture of the Rosenwald building. And so yearbooks, all of that kind of stuff has information that I think also can help in your search for for that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, the only the only update from what Dorothy said is Fisk. It, there's been the online database, and they're they're redoing it. Um, so it should it should open. I don't know the timeline on it, but the uh, if you go to um, Rosenwald.fisk.edu, mm -hmm. uh, that's the database, and it's under construction. Um, but was, you can call. But you can call, yes, and and they they, they are a wonderful staff and will help you. Um, they'll even get photos for you of schools that they may have. Yeah, I got a couple questions. First, what was the name of that book that you was talking about in the office? And I'll have it up here afterwards, so if you want to come up and it's called The Rosenwald yes, Schools of the American yeah. South okay. by Dr. Uh, Mary Hoffswelly. Now, for the Historical Preservation Society or whatever, when it talks about repairing these schools, like a hole in the roof, uh, it doesn't have any, any restrictions as to how much the exterior or the, the interior preservation has to be maintained in order to, to get a fund to finish the project. Is there any restriction or prohibition on that? So uh, it, it ultimately, the, so I think the question is, um, are there restrictions if you're trying to get grant funding? Right. Are there restrictions on the type of work you can do? It really depends on the grant uh, that you're pursuing. Um, what the National Park Service uh, grants require is that you follow a set of standards referred to as the, it's a mouthful, but the Secretary of the Interior's standards for either rehabilitation or restoration. So within that, there are you know, kind of 10 to 15 bullet points you, you try to follow. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be determined by that kind of grant organization. So since we have a, a federal grant with the National Park Service, we have to follow those restrictions. The state may have, um, you know, I, I know um, there's the uh, preserve Architecturally Significant Sites grant that Alabama uh, just rolled out this year um, through the Alabama Historic Commission. I mm -hmm. uh, just want to make sure I'm not saying that wrong. Um, and that, those would be state dollars that would help support um, the, the preservation project. Uh, we're, we're working with the Midway School, uh, uh, sorry, the Merritt School down in Midway. They received uh, yeah, a past <laughs> grant this year. <laughs> Uh, to, to work on the, the Midway School. So um, I, I'd be happy to answer more, more specific questions afterwards. If, but it's important you look at the requirements of the grant dollars. And the National Trust for Historic Preservation mm -hmm. also has grant funds available 
Um, part of what you want to want to do if you're looking for funding for a project, uh, you want to start with the your state historic preservation office, and in this case, it's the Alabama Historical Commission, our office, um, and talk with somebody about the building, whether it is you know how much of the original building is still there, or if there have been changes, it doesn't mean that it cannot be. Um, you can't, you won't get a grant for it. It's just a matter of starting with someone who is knowledgeable about historic buildings and getting them to assess the building. Um, and, and, and it goes back to, again, just because the building isn't a Rosenwald School, Harris Bears people will tell mm -hmm. you, um, doesn't mean it's not significant, mm -hmm. right? And again, equalization schools, these were schools built, school buildings or school campuses built from the 1940s, late 1940s, up until the late 1960s, these buildings, these brick buildings, long flat buildings with a flat roof, with steel windows, um, concrete walk, uh, uh, concrete walkways that are covered uh, with hallways lining the inside uh, with concrete block, those buildings are super significant into the history of education in the South. And just because the, your building is not a Rosenwald School building, doesn't mean it's not a significant building. So the Historical Commission is interested in helping to preserve and document all historic buildings. Um, so, but we want to make sure that if it is a Rosenwald School building, we help you preserve those things that make it characteristically, the, the windows and all those, those features that make it characteristically a Rosenwald School. Good evening. I'm Tammy Montgomery. I met Dorothy Walker about a decade and a half ago, but we were fighting a major highway coming through um, land that had come from the Freedmen's um, that was held by black farm owners that uh, just across the next major highway would be property that was owned by white owners that was just Timberland, but they wanted to bring this through our neighborhood. And Ms. Walker was gracious enough to come and do a tour through our little neighborhood. She probably, it's called Freetown. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, learning, hearing Mr. Boyd talk about how the land was given for the schools. I've traced how my family originally gave the property. Then it was deeded to the Board of Education and then uh, desegregation. It was auctioned off and my family purchased it back. But I'd like for you to address the significance of that cycle of, of further immersing the black community's property, taking it with that kind of action, because that, that highway is, is still on the cusp. There, there wasn't money pre-COVID for the highway. And so we're trying to establish and put that marker down that this was a Rosenwald school, how that can be significant in preserving black owned property, those hundreds of acres, if it's, you know, divided up like Brooklyn was when, when you know, the major towns and they ran the highways and the railways through there and just destroyed the area. But I'd like you to address the significance of really preserving and showing what black communities did in order to get the education of their children established. That's a lot. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, that's one of the things I was saying earlier is Rosenwald School history is, a, is an important part of Southern educational history, particularly African American history in the South. But there were black school buildings and black history and black uh, communities providing educational opportunities for, for students before Rosenwald got involved, be and even before Washington. Um, and so those school, that history is, is all important, is all important. And so that's why I, I, I wanna emphasize tonight that as much as you, you got, we all care about Rosenwald schools, but I, I want us to also care about the schools that were not Rosenwald schools or the schools that came before, or the school buildings that came after. Because those equalization schools, a lot of those, like Mr. Boyd said, got integrated. And, uh, or integration forced the closure of those school buildings. And 
we and we are losing no school buildings at the same rate that we've lost Rosenwald school buildings over time. And so the historical commission wants to help people, anyone preserve, whether it's a school building, whether it's a church, a cemetery, all of that, all of that matters. And that's what we're about. But the technology that they're doing, that they're using to do this now, if the buildings are gone, if the if they're if and we hope they're not, but if they are, the technology can be used to actually create or recreate, particularly for young people, what was there. It's interesting technology, and you're talking about grants. That's one of the things grant funders want to fund is being able to integrate the technology with these historic places. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've had uh, a couple of folks uh, reach out to me in communities where the Rosenwald School no longer exists and interested in kind of reconstructing it uh, as, a, as a physical thing. But you could also start to think about reconstructing it as a, as a digital thing, right? as something that exists on the computer, which sounds a little weird. But, um, but uh, if you kind of paid attention in the exhibit, we had the kind of video, the virtual walkthrough of, of uh, Rosenwald School. That was all kind of built digitally. And so, uh, again, I think the um, whether it's a physical building or becomes a kind of digital thing, uh, the most important thing is that kind of story that gets kind of shared and passed. Um, so the kind of digital projects are becoming more and more uh, common. You're starting to see them pop up. Um, but uh, I, th I think they, they have a, a, a place at the table as well. And to, to your point uh, about the community, Mr. Boyd, I remember when I first came to Tankersley, it wasn't the, the building, I knew the, I knew the history of the building when I got there. But what, what engaged me, what made me, what made me wanna do something to help preserve this building was for people like Mr. Boyd who talked to me about this history and what it meant to communities. Will you speak about that a little bit, sir? Uh, what, it, what it means to me is uh, I'm a product of a uh, Rosenwald school. And without Rosenwald school, I wouldn't have had any education because uh, my parents couldn't drive me to Montgomery for an education. And what does it mean to the community to preserve that building? Uh, it means uh, a lot to them that we can uh, tell the children about it. And uh, show that we are trying to preserve. And, uh, and how far we've come. We've come a long way. But Mr. Andrew, Robert Jones and Andrew Bryant bought this uh, property from the Board of Education where the tank of the school sits right now. And uh, but, uh, we were trying to restore it ourselves, but our funds ran out. And uh, <laughs> Auburn University stepped in. And uh, I think we're on the move right now. That's good to hear. We are actually at time. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and seeing the exhibit. Please come back and bring other people as well. And thank you so much for your attendance. Before everyone leaves, um, oh. if you are at all associated with a uh, Rosenwald school, if you could please gather in the main lobby, um, just the one right here on the first floor, we'd like to take your picture. Uh, so please, if you are associated with a Rosenwald school, please meet there. Oh, what's one thing? <laughs>